Welcome to session 2 of Technology and Urban Design, The Machine City and Modernity, Part 2. In Part 1, we had discussed the emergence of, of new thought uh, in Europe, which led to the advent of the Industrial Age. And we looked at the impacts that this industrialization had on the concept of the city and how this completely revised the way in which we look at the technology that builds cities as well as the nature of the city itself and the conflicts as well as the as well as the opportunities that the cities provided let's look at a, a problem of hausmann of baron hausmann who was a close associate of napoleon the 3rd of france who was the emperor and his problems are uh, or rather the problem as I have put it is quite similar to something that John Nash faced a few years ago before him in that Paris at in the 1700s was this dense medieval city with a number of narrow lanes and a fairly uh, what we would call a fragmented winding morphology today. Uh, this presented a problem to a, to a country that was priding itself on its modernism, on its industrialization and wished to see nice, broad, clean streets everywhere. And yet they were confronted with these, uh, with these tiny little streets all over uh, Paris, which, uh, which were completely, which were built organically over time and were essentially belonged to an age that uh, an age that was probably that was already over the medieval age and this challenged the uh, people of paris and uh, in general and baron hausmann who was tasked with with reshaping paris in particular and this was the scale. Uh, these are a few photographs of, uh, of streets that were uh, untouched by Hausmann in his program. And these were the uh, and these are the uh, scales of the streets the, of, uh, that existed prior to Hausmann's famous uh, uh, program of uh, reshaping Paris. And as you can see, these were narrow streets that were filled with uh, that were uh, tall with tall buildings on either side and this was at the time considered unhealthy it was considered uh, it was considered a relic of a previous age that did not have relevance in a modern world anymore and so this perception which was partially which was based in a f in great reality because you had fires that spread from building to building extremely fast. You had diseases that spread extremely fast. But there was also, at the bottom of it, there was also this, in addition to the reality of the situation, there was also this perception that this was not the way to build cities anymore. This was not the way to live in cities anymore. Therefore, Baron Hausmann decided to pretty much cut London in a number of different ways, some of which you will see in this diagram shown, uh, shown here. And he started to create a number of wide streets where uh, there weren't any wide streets before and he called these boulevards and he created avenues which were lined with great tree, were lined with trees and he pretty much destroyed the, the pre-existing fabric of medieval Paris. And what this and this had a number of impacts on the city itself the this was what he proposed to do at the uh, near the Notre Dame Cathedral where he uh, uh, where he uh, created these smooth straight lines in place of these winding sinuous streets that characterized Paris of that time and what he created was something like this, captured in the great Impressionist Camille Pissarro's uh, paintings, uh, 
where he create uh, where paris was suddenly became this wide uh, beautiful open city with a number of great boulevards running through and this this created a sense of paris being the the most modern city of the world in the 1800s and it enlivened and it and uh, it became the center of the impressionists and the post impressionists and was the center of art and culture for a very long time uh, uh, for a very long time perhaps even until the beginning of the second world war however houseman did this at an almost immeasurable price of uh, by displacing thousands of people and demolishing thousands of houses and for and the protests that it caused the opposition that he faced eventually led to him being replaced uh, being removed from uh, his position as the person who was directing all of this uh, reconstruct all of this reshaping of paris and so once again just like john nash we are faced with this question of what the price of good urban design is and what the price of uh, war and whether and who should pay that price and whether the price is worth what you get in return and modern paris much like modern london has a lot to thank houseman for in terms of the scale and it is these grand boulevards and grand avenues that uh, that he created which allow uh, which allow paris to be accessible today compared to the way uh, the way the city was uh, 200 or 300 years before and he also created these grand public projects like the like the great parks of paris which were also uh, which were also built on land that was essentially occupied a generation earlier and it was done through displacement and it is this balancing act which begins at the birth of the modern age that still challenges us today even in in every aspect of urban design is who pays the price of some some work done for the public good and very often it is the poor and sometimes it's it's not but it's it is this cost and benefit Uh, this weighing of cost and benefit that is at the heart of decisions that urban designers have to make every day in their work this phenomena of industrialization and the impact that it has on cities is not just restricted to uh, is not just restricted to the european countries but spreads outward into their colonies this is the uh, these are a few maps showing the evolution of uh, madras as it was as chennai was called then from from a small uh, factory in the beginning in the 1600s all the way to a busy metropolis uh, perhaps the third or the fourth largest city of the british empire in the 1900s and it's and this evolution happens primarily because of this grand growth of the city uh, of the city from being just a trading village a fishing village and then the british converted it into a trading post to a center for industrial uh, for the marketing of industrial goods as well as the production of uh, industrial goods and all of these colonies essentially acted as feeders for the great factories in europe and the raw materials would uh, leave from these great colonial port cities and then come back as finished products and so and this has a direct impact on the city itself and on the shape that these great colonial cities take another example of another of a colonial city that uh, grew rapidly is is at the other end of the world in in perhaps the farthest uh, city uh, uh in the world uh, with regard to distance is sydney and sydney which is an uh, which was the first australian city essentially begins as a trading post but big, but grows rapidly into uh, into a center for the trading of these industrial goods and uh, given the mineral wealth of australia uh, then and now uh, 
a lot of these material a lot of these raw materials were pumped out into the ocean into Europe and then similar to the colonial cities of India they received the finished goods and then those were sold to the uh, to the resident populations so the impact of this the impact of this uh, industrialization is felt throughout the world and it's felt throughout uh, and it's felt uh, perhaps for good or bad in to a great extent in the colonial cities themselves the emergence of the industrial age also creates the rise of the great corporations the most famous and infamous of them being the east india companies of of the dutch india east india company and the immensely successful british east india company and these companies become governments on their own and so they start to build these great these great towns dedicated to themselves and these industry uh, to house and uh, this was also uh, this was also in response to the poor working conditions that a number of people were criticizing so these countries uh, so these companies start to become little countries on their own and they start to build and these towns that they built are called are famously called the company towns the first uh, one of the first being the famous salt works uh, by claude ledo at a place called shaw in uh, 1775 and this was a perfect example of what they thought the company town looked like which was neat orderly perfectly geometric and centered towards the f- and focused towards the factory of the center and the emphasis was on the factory the emphasis was on this great project that they were undertaking of producing something which would be uh, which would be consumed by everyone and the the regularity of the geometry the severity of the symmetry is quite strong and it's something that bas- that reminds you of other palaces uh, of uh, of palaces like versailles where the symmetry is used as a uh, to reinforce the structures of power and the design itself becomes a tool of something more than just the uh, more than its so called utilitarian value uh, this is the plan of uh, show as it was finally conceived and this is a visual of uh, of the building as uh, of the salt works as it would have uh, eventually been built had it been built in full but there is a lot of resistance to this concept of uh, this concept of the company town and this is an image of uh, the of the famous uh, pullman factory strike in 1894 uh, where people walked out of the factory but because people started to then resent the level of control that uh, the owners who built these towns who built these uh these small cities uh, which were countries in themselves people started to resent and started to question the the level of authority that these neat planned perfectly organized towns have and it's a it's a very relevant question as we keep uh, as we keep encountering these more and more and more uh, over the years the famous bonville uh, bonville is a famous town in britain uh, built by the cadbury uh, by the owners of the cadbury uh, confectioners and this was meant to be a model village which would basically balance uh, which was basically a uh, uh, revolt against the industrial uh, city of uh, uh, that was depicted in people like dickens and gustav dore and you can start to see that uh, and the images that they produced uh, in to support the building of this town essentially leads to this great uh, embrace of the village as a as a place in as a setting uh, mixed with the urban uh, mixed with the urban ethos which would then become very important in the next few decades as we will see in a few slides we also in india we have extensive experience with this uh, with the towns being built by a single entity famously jamshedpur bhilai bokaro and all of these uh, and all of these present uh, a very strange duality in terms of whether uh, of who should build and design these cities as uh, as to 
compared to uh, say a popular uh, demand or, or design of a city, would a single entity be able to design a sustainable city? And some of these examples are extremely successful and some of them are not. But it is a question that underlies most of these industrial towns which are essentially single, uh, which are essentially highly controlled environments which uh, are built by more or less individuals and groups of individuals. In the early 1900s, the second industrial revolution starts, which is essentially the emergence of steel to replace iron uh, as a primary building and, uh, and uh, industrial material. The invention of commercially available electricity, this is a famous photograph of Nikola Tesla uh, with his AC coils, uh, with his alternating current coils. And the automobile as uh, uh, and the beginnings of the automobile, although the automobile would take a long time to become popular, but electricity and uh, but electricity is crucial because for the first time we start to see commercially available a commercially available means of energy and this radically changes the world as you would imagine it would because we can now switch on light bulbs, we can, now, uh, we can now do a number of things that become possible because of a source of energy that is available very simply and is very cheap and is also uh, can be used in an almost infinite variety of ways. The motor car is also important, but it takes a little time to get there. Perhaps the most significant uh, piece of invention which radically changed cities themselves is the invention of the ladies bicycle which allowed women an utter freedom of mobility which was not available to them before. It allowed European women to work in, uh, in uh, professions other than just uh, uh, as maids or uh, other household services. They could now travel great distances which means they could study. They could do, they could work in, an, uh, in cities which was uh, exclusively the domain of men and they could do a number of other uh, uh, things because of this mobility. The rise of the, alternatively the rise of the railroad as discussed earlier allows for, uh, allows for uh, travel on a mass scale. However, the, the bicycle itself leads to the invention of the macadamized road which is essentially uh, the modern road as we understand it. And these are roads no longer designed for animals uh, like horses and bullocks, but roads designed for tires and wheels, which allow, uh, which are far smoother and far more uh, and allow, uh, uh, allow a greater amount of distance to be carried uh, through a day. We also see the rise of communications like the great telegraph lines that were laid in the 1890s including to Bombay and, Ch and uh, Madras uh, connected to all over, connected the, to the entire world. We see the rise of radio, the invention of the telephone and this all leads to this extraordinary invention, uh, extraordinary period of invention which once again similar to the generation before radically reinvents the city. It, it, and the city which is the, the arena, the theater for all of this technology to emerge starts to transform itself. And this also unfortunately leads to the first industrial war which is the first world war which, which essentially takes all of this technology that's been invented and then and then finds a war uh, finds a way to to weaponize it and for the first time civilian populations are affected on a scale never seen before and this leads to a great questioning of the role of technology but at the same time it also leads to a certain celebration of it the immediate, the generation that saw the first world war at a young age becomes perhaps one of the greatest generations in history where we see great artists like Picasso, scientists like Einstein, uh, 
and uh, and political thinkers like mahatma gandhi emerge from the ashes of the first world war which which is becomes a symbol of what was wrong with the world and all of these people start to question the role that technology plays in society and some of them embrace it some of them critique it and some of them utterly reject it like uh, mahatma gandhi did and this somehow leads to a sense of this somehow leads to a sense of perhaps questioning of what tech, of the role that technology plays in our daily lives however the first world war itself leads to another revolution in russia which we call the russian revolution today and the russians are essentially they embrace technology as a means of uh, allowing the uh, the soviets essentially embrace revolution as a means of uh, of elevating the pres- the peasant to a worker and therefore uh, allowing him to have a better uh, form of life the the socialists then invent perhaps one of the most enduring uh, aesthetic movements in uh, in history uh, called the constructivists and a number of, and very and a number of these constructivist monuments were built but however their drawings and their concepts are extremely powerful and uh, most famously is tatlin's monument to the third international seen on the bottom right uh, corner uh, seen on the bottom right and the and this is an extremely machinist aesthetic it's it celebrates the power of the machine to elevate uh, people in society and people uh, that inspires people like uh, that in uh, uh, and they are also or rather they are inspired by the futurists uh perhaps the most famous uh person being antonio santalia who draws these imaginary cities which are in which are deeply machinistic and yet deeply uh, heroic in some sense and and the futurists much like the constructivists are celebrating the machine and they're somehow in, infusing that celebration into their urban design and into their architecture and these are uh, santalia's famous sketches of the new city or, or la cita nova as he called it and Ant- antonio santalia himself was a victim of the first world war so there is a deep suspicion as well as a deep as well as a profound celebration of the act of war as well as the as well as the war that the machines allow to happen this leads to perhaps the most productive uh period in uh, urban design and urban planning you have the emergence of uh, of ebenezer howard's garden cities of tomorrow which incorporates both green space as well as industrial space as well as residential space within the city and then we have the industrial city by tony garnier uh, in 1904 which is essentially a, a, a attempts to balance the nature and the industrial city and produces uh, and produces a very famous uh, set of images and perhaps the most famous or perhaps the most infamous is the radiant city by corbusier uh, by le corbusier where he demolishes a huge part of paris and then installs his cru- famous cruciform towers in the in the city uh, in the city of paris as an alternative to the uh, to what is generally perceived as a parisian street and radically redefines it on the other side of the world in america one particular invention upends urban design completely and that is the invention of uh, uh, the safety elevator essentially an elevator that would not uh, that would not fall even from a great height and this allows the transformation of what is a fairly typical port town which is not very similar from which is not very dissimilar from cities like chennai or sydney and uh, and uh, and this city is called new york and new york transforms itself as you can see from this image in 1873 it transforms itself into by 1913 Uh, as you can see through this image as something that is starting to look like the new york of today and the elevator this single piece of technology the elevator uh, 
allows buildings to grow taller they it allows them to uh, it allows buildings to be built at hitherto unseen heights and then new york transform is transformed even by 1938 into something that very similar to what we say today and the skyline and this idea of the skyline of the city rather than uh, the image of the the image of the city is dominated by this concept of the skyline and this is popular primarily because of technological reasons and this is perhaps one of the best example of the impact that one particular uh, form of technology can have on urban form itself one of the most important doctrines of uh, the post first world war era was the emergence of the athens charter which was essentially supposed to be written by uh, by the ciam or the congress of international modern architects but was fundamentally written by le corbusier and it it exposes this idea of the of corbusier's that of uh, of functionalism and he and it talks extensively about creating a functional city now this is a radical concept even then but it is something that somehow attracts a lot of people because it talks about the city in terms that a lot of people under uh, a lot of people celebrate like utility and practicality and these are words that are that have become extremely important in in the aftermath of the industrialization and people start to apply it to the city as a whole and therefore the functionalist city starts to become an idea that's very important and it's an idea that we're still dealing with today in many different forms this leads to a second world war uh, this leads us to the second world war and the destruction that we see in the wake of the second world war and this means that a number of these cities have to be rebuilt and they have to be reshaped to accommodate this level of uh, uh, this level of uh, destruction and so a new way forward is proposed and the functionalist the functionalist city fills the void caused by the destruction uh, and also uh, and also the aftermath of the second world war sees rapid decolonization so cities like brasilia and of course our own chandigarh are built in the are built as with the echoes of this concept of the functional city as it emerges uh, through the uh, generations as or rather as it emerges from uh, uh, from the uh, different uh, uh, people who expose it the americans go a different way and they invent this concept of the suburb and the car another very important technology frees up the space and proximity no longer becomes the most crucial aspect of a city and this leads to in the aftermath of the second world war leads to a rapid suburbanization of of places like in america and the and the texture of the city itself changes and the that hollows out the centers of cities and city and the city is no longer the place to be but the but that importance shifts to the suburb and that's because of the proliferation of the car and the roads that the cars that are built for the cars let's conclude with a important example of the impact that uh, cities of industrialization uh, uh, and the functional city this is a famous uh, project called pruitt ego by minoru yamasaki who also happened to design the world trade center uh, this was uh, this was one of the great examples of a functionalist city and all that uh, a functional uh, functionalist city could be and we see uh, and it won nearly every architectural award there was to win however in the years that followed the the city st- people started to question uh, this particular project and it became a, and because of the unlivable conditions and because of the nature of the design it became one of the most uh, criticized projects and something that was built in 1958 by 1972 is demolished and this is a famous series of photographs called the fall of modernism and we enter into an era that starts to radically question whether functionalist architecture is appropriate anymore
and whether the functionalist city is even is even possible people like jane jacobs people uh, like uh, uh, people like kevin lynch start to reexamine this idea of of a city that is subject to technology rather than a city that uses technology this image symbolizes perhaps most famously that uh, that revision of uh, priorities so that ends part 2 and that also ends the second session which is on the machine city and modernity ultimately the machine is something that is deeply inter- integrated with our understanding of the modern city it is inevitable and it is and it is something that we have struggled to understand to manage and sometimes we have worshiped it and sometimes we have deeply criticized it and yet it is a deeply it is deeply ingrained within the texture of the modern city and for better or for worse we have to understand the impact that modernity that the machine city has on modernity and and it is fundamental to our understanding of it thank you